So welcome back. So this video is on uniform convergence and integration. And the theorem that we're discussing is the fact that the uniform limit of a sequence of integrable functions is itself integrable. And the value of its integral is equal to the limit of the values of the integrals of the sequence of functions. So we will prove this later on. At the moment, I'm just giving you counterexamples to show that if you take away the uniform convergence and just have mere pointwise convergence, then this doesn't hold true. So I've already given you an example of how uh, you can have a sequence of integrable functions that converges pointwise to a function that is not integrable. Now I'm going to give you another counterexample where the sequence of functions will converge to a function that is integrable, but this bit will break, i.e. the integral of the limit, which will just be a pointwise limit, is not equal to the limit of the integrals. So this theorem can break in two different ways if you take away the uniform convergence, is my point to all of this. So here is the counterexample that I have concocted. So my sequence of functions, again, is going to be defined over the closed interval 0, 1, and they're going to be real-valued functions, of course. And this is how I'm going to define each one of them. So fn will map x onto, and it's a compound function defined as so. So it's going to map the point 0 always onto 0. So every single one of them will be 0 at 0. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. And then... On the interval, 0 not including 0 up to 1 over n, and I'll include 1 over n in that, uh, although you don't have to, you could have an open interval here, but I'm going to include that 1 over n. I'm going to map it onto n, and then afterwards, from 1 over n to 1, not including 1 over n, and all the way up to 1, I'm going to map it onto 0. So I'll just go for a few first few examples of this so that you get the idea. So I've drawn a picture with the first one, f1, here. So here's my closed interval, 0, 1. And then if I think about putting n is equal to 1, so 0 is going to be mapped onto 0, so there is 0 plotted on there. And then now n is equal to 1, so actually I won't need this bit here. It's going to be going from 0 to 1 over 1, uh, which will be from 0 all the way up to 1. And it's going to map it onto n, which is 1. So it's going to be 1 on the whole of the rest of my domain. So everything apart from 0 is going to now be mapped onto 1. So this is the function f1 in my sequence of functions. Now let's have a look at f2. So again, f2 will map the point 0 onto 0. So I've kind of put that in there, and then we're doing f2 in blue. And then on the interval from 0 to a half, it's going to map it onto 2. So this is all of these points being mapped onto 2, which is up here. And then after you pass a half, then the rest of the domain, so from a half to one, is going to be mapped onto zero. So that's back down here. So that's F2. And then finally, I've added F3 onto this picture. So again, F3 will map zero onto zero. And then on the interval from zero to a third, it will be mapped onto now three, so all the way up here. And then after you've gone above a third, so a third to one, that will be mapped onto zero. So hopefully those three have given you an idea for what this sequence of functions is going to do. As you get bigger and bigger in n, this interval here, where you're not mapping the, fun uh, the points onto zero, will get smaller and smaller. Uh, we've seen it get smaller with just these first three. For f1, it was the whole, well, pretty much the whole of the domain. f2 it went to half of it, F3, it went to a third of it, and so on. As you get bigger and bigger, it's going to get smaller and smaller. But what it's mapping it onto is going to get higher and higher and higher. And you can see, hopefully, why I've done this, because these functions are all going to be Riemann integrable, and you can see, hopefully, that the values of their integrals are all going to be the same, because the bit that is going to contribute is the non-zero bit, and even though the length of the interval is getting smaller and smaller, the height is getting higher and higher, so the area that's going to actually be contained there is going to always be the same. We'll discuss that more in a moment. Um, so as you go on and on, the amount of the domain that is being mapped onto zero is going to get bigger and bigger, and the bit that isn't being mapped onto zero is going to get smaller and smaller, but it's going to be mapped onto a higher and higher number. So you can imagine F4, you'll have 
0 to a quarter here being the only bit that's not mapped onto 0, and it will be going to 4, and then F5 you'll have um, 0 to a fifth, and it will be the only bit that's not being mapped onto 0, and it will be being mapped onto 5, and so on. Uh, it is important that we map 0 not onto the non-zero bit, but onto 0, uh, so that when we consider the limit of this, we don't have the limit uh, at 0 going off to infinity. So as I've said, all of the functions in this sequence of functions are going to be integrable over the interval 0, 1, Riemann integrable. Um, and the reason for that is they're pretty much just constant functions. So on the interval from 0 to 1 over n, they have the value n. Now, OK, at the end point of that closed interval, at the 0 end point, it's not being mapped onto n, it's being mapped onto 0, but that one single point that's being mapped onto something different does not suddenly make the function non-integrable, and it doesn't change the value of the integral. So the area under that constant part of the function that isn't 0 is just going to be the length of the interval on which it's non-zero, which is 1 over n, times the height of it, which is n. So it's just going to be n times 1 over n, and you can see now it comes out as a constant value for all of the functions. It's going to be 1. And then, of course, the integral on the bits where it's 0, the rest of the interval here, from 1 over n to 1, that's just going to be 0. So these functions are all going to be Riemann integrable, and their values of the integrals are all going to be 1. So we have a sequence of integrable functions then where the integrals are all equal to 1. Let's now think whether this sequence of functions has a limit. And I claim that it does have a limit, and the limit is the zero function everywhere. So fn converges to f where f maps x onto 0 for all x is an element of this closed interval 0, 1. So let's think through the reason for this. So intuitively, if we think about the picture of what this sequence of functions looks like, as you progress on, the amount of the domain that is being mapped onto zero is going to get bigger and bigger, and indeed is going to approach being the entire domain. So that's intuitively why it's converging to the zero function. Uh, but more formally, what we need to do is think about each point in the domain and think about its pointwise sequence and what the limit of that pointwise sequence is. So let's start with the point x is equal to zero, because that's a special case. You can see that all of the functions in this sequence all map zero onto zero. So its pointwise sequence is just going to be a sequence of zeros, which of course has a limit, and its limit is zero. Therefore, the limit function is going to be zero at x is equal to zero. Now think about an x that isn't zero. We can consider the rest of the domain all in one go. So any point that isn't zero, so is in the open interval from zero to one included, um, then no matter which x you pick, even if it's really, really close to zero, at some point in this sequence of functions, you will get to a high enough n that actually 1 over n will be smaller than whatever point you've picked. So there'll always be an n such that 1 over n is less than whichever point you've picked that is greater than 0. And then, if you go along to that function, then that function will map your point onto 0 because your point will be in this part of the domain from 1 over n to 1. And, of course, all functions afterwards, they will have an even smaller interval that's being not mapped onto 0, and so they'll also map your point onto 0. So what I'm saying here is that whatever point you pick, there will be a point in this sequence where at that function, and for all functions beyond this in the sequence, they map your point onto zero, and therefore if you consider its pointwise sequence, its pointwise sequence might be getting bigger and bigger for the first finitely many terms, but then afterwards, after a certain point, after you've got to the point where actually you're in this part of the domain now, um, then your sequence will become all zeros, and it doesn't matter about that finite bit at the front of the sequence, the infinite number of zeros is what matters, and therefore it's going to have a limit, and its limit is going to be zero. So indeed, every single point's pointwise sequence is a, a sequence that eventually converges to zero. So therefore, every point is going to be mapped onto zero by the limit function.
So just to illustrate that, if I take a specific point, say x is equal to one tenth, and I consider what its pointwise sequence is going to be, i.e. I evaluate all of these functions at one tenth and put what their values are and create that sequence, that's the pointwise sequence, it's going to look like this. So for the first function, it's going to be mapped onto one because it's going to be within the domain here from zero to one over one that is mapped onto one. And then for the second function, it's again within 0, 1 half, so it's going to be mapped onto 2. And this will continue all the way up to the tenth function, where it will still be in 0 to 1 tenth, and therefore it will be mapped onto 10. So point 10 in the sequence, or term 10 in the sequence, will be 10. But then once you go beyond that, once you go to the eleventh function, it's now no longer in this part of the domain, which will be 0 to 1 over 11, that is not being mapped onto 0. It will be in this part of the domain now, so it will suddenly become be mapped onto 0. And for all ones beyond it, so when you go to the twelfth, it's certainly not going to be in that part of the domain that's not being mapped onto 0 now, because it will be only up to 1 twelfth now, and so on. So it will because it will have this infinite tail of zeros and that'll be the case for whatever point you pick that there will always be some point in this pointwise sequence where it becomes zero and then stays zero forever it will always have an infinite tail of zeros and just this finite pass at the front or finitely number finite number of term part at the front where it goes up 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 for a while but then it drops off to zero always so whatever point you pick the limit of this term pointwise sequence uh, will always be zero. So the zero function is integrable, so our limit function is integrable, and its integral of course is going to be zero. The zero function has zero area underneath it. So you can see that the integral of the limit function here exists, but it is not equal to the limit of the values of the integrals, because all of these functions, their integral is always 1. So this sequence of integral values would just be the sequence 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, which has limit 1. So this equality here isn't holding true. And the thing that is going wrong again is that we don't have uniform convergence here. We just have pointwise convergence. And it's pretty obvious that this sequence of functions does not converge uniformly to the zero function. Uh, just drawing a picture to explain this, here is the limit, our zero function in purple here. Let's take epsilon is equal to a quarter and think about the uniform convergence criterion with epsilon is equal to a quarter. So I've drawn the epsilon is equal to a quarter interval on either side of our limit function here. And if this sequence of functions converge uniformly to this limit, it would have to be the case that there was some uh, function in this sequence, so an f big n, such that it and all the functions beyond it in the sequence are within this um, tube that I've drawn around the limit function. So everywhere on your domain, it would have to be within uh, a quarter of the limit function. And of course, that's not going to be true, because whatever big n you take, however far you go along in this sequence of functions, there is always going to be that part of the domain that isn't being mapped onto zero, uh, that part of the domain zero to one over uh, big n, uh, that will be mapped onto something potentially huge as big n gets bigger and bigger. Yes, it's getting smaller and smaller, the part of the domain that isn't being mapped onto zero, but it's still always going to be there, that tiny little bit of the domain that's being mapped onto something huge and won't be within this uh, quarter interval of the limit function. So no matter how far you go along in the sequence, you're never going to be able to find a function that is everywhere on the domain within a quarter of this limit function zero. Uh, so it doesn't even fulfill the uniform convergence criterion for epsilon is equal to a quarter, so it can't fulfill the uniform convergence criterion. So what I've illustrated then so far is how this beautiful theorem that we're discussing can break in two different ways if you don't have uniform convergence and you only have pointwise convergence. We'll have a break here and in the next video we'll move on to actually proving that if you do have uniform convergence it does hold true.